بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته أجمعين ومن سار على نهجهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we're going to continue today with our discussion on the fiqh of fasting and basically what we are talking about are some rules and regulations pertaining to the fast. So what we'll do is just to refresh our memory of what we've done. As I said very quickly, um, we're looking into the book Umdatul Fiqh, which is a Hanbali fiqh manual, but then we are mentioning the opinions of other uh, scholars and uh, what the most what the most correct opinion uh, appears to be insha'Allah ta'ala. So we started out we started out with Kitab al-Siyam, the book of fasting, and the author begins speaking about those upon whom fasting is an obligation. We covered that. We also talked about uh, the moon sighting and, and, and things related to that and what different people would do in different, in different situations. Where we reached the last time was this point where the author speaks of those people for whom it is permissible not to fast. So there are certain categories of people who do not have to fast during the month of Ramadan. He says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Babu Ahkam in Muftirina fi Ramadan. Wa yubahu al fitru fi Ramadana li arbaati aksam. So here he says that there are four categories of people for whom al fitr, and al fitr here means not fasting, is permissible. So four categories of people for whom fa not fasting is permissible. Meaning what? This implies several things. That statement of his implies several things. Firstly, if it is permissible for certain people not to observe the fast, it means that the basic principle is that fasting, and here we're speaking about the month of Ramadan, is an obligation upon all Muslims who meet those requirements, if you will, that we spoke about in our very first session. So the basic principle is that as siyam fasting in Ramadan, is fard, it is wajib. But it is permissible for certain categories of people not to fast. The other thing this implies is these categories that we will be speaking of are people whom it is permissible for them to fast under certain circumstances as well. But it is allowed for them also not to fast. Anyway, those details we get to uh, in a short while. He says, Ahaduha. So now he's mentioning the four, starting with the first. Al Maridu Ladi Yata Dorra Rubih, Wal Musafiru Ladi Lahul Kasur, Fal Fitru Lahuma Afbal, Wa Alehima Al Kaba, Wa In Sama Ajaza Ahuma. So he's making a very concise statement. Like we said, this is a fiqh manual, it's, it's very concise. And we just need to elaborate, and we already spoke about this. So I'm going to summarize what we said about this. He said, first of all, the one who is ill and who would be harmed because of his illness. 
So if you have a person who is ill, well, they, they could fall under one of, I suppose, three general categories. A person who is ill or sick, but whatever illness or sickness that they're experiencing would not have any impact or any effect on their fast. Things such as a mild headache, a sore leg, an aching back, a paper cut, right? So these are, for all intents and purposes, we say that the person is not in, in, in perfect health. So this is why they refer to this as an ailment or a sickness or an illness. So a person who would not be affected or whose ailment, if you will, would not affect the fast, that person, that person is not permitted to break the fast. They have to fast because, you know, uh, a mild toothache, something that can be tolerated or, you know, as I said, maybe a sore leg. It's nothing major. It's something relatively minor and it's not like they need, they need to be on painkillers and so on and so forth. Well, this is something that can easily be tolerated, and so we say for that person they must, they must observe the fast. Another category is a person who is ill, and for them to fast is detrimental to them, meaning that by fasting they could be leading to their own death, or they could, fasting would lead to something very serious and severe in terms of an illness. This person, we say, is haram for them to fast. They shouldn't fast at all because Allah Jalla has not imposed any difficulty upon us in this religion. And, and Allah Jalla does not want us to harm ourselves in any way, shape, or form. So then, as far as an individual who if they were going to fast, it would either lead to their death or it would lead to something very severe and serious, it is not permissible for them to fast. So the category that he's speaking of is those people who are ill and they can fast, but it would be quite difficult, you know, and there may be some sort of harm that comes to them. In other words, perhaps by them fasting, they're not going to be able to take their medications regularly. And so it may, it may cause the illness to be prolonged. It will take longer for them to heal. Okay? So in this case we say, it is permissible for them to fast. And if they did, their fast would be valid. But is it the better thing to do? This is why he says, وَإِن صَامَ أَجْزَأَهُمَا so particularly when we come to the issue of the person who is sick and fasting is not detrimental, but it causes some hardship, then we say to them, in this case, it is better for you not to fast. It is better for you not to fast, but if you did, it would be, it would be permissible. So this is the, 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 the person who is ill and who would be affected by it in a negative way, adversely affected by the fast. وَالْمُسَافِرُ الَّذِي لَهُ الْقَصْرِ And the traveler who is allowed to shorten the prayer. And travelers are of different types. You have people who travel for a legitimate shari or religious reason. Somebody who is going for Umrah, somebody who is going for Hajj, somebody who is going to visit their parents, somebody who is who's, who's traveling for the sake of Siratul Rahim, they want to maintain family ties with, with some of their family members. Some legitimate shari'i reason, a purpose, a religious purpose even. Okay, so these types of people we say that if they are traveling, this is a permissible journey that they are undertaking and absolutely it is permissible for them to not fast as long as they are traveling. Okay, and, and, and to make it short because uh, the whole issue of, of traveling and, and what constitutes traveling and so on and so forth can be, uh, can be rather complicated, but we want to make it as, uh, as, as simplified as possible. So which person is considered to be a traveler? Or when is a person considered to be a traveler? 
There are a few things. One is a person who is going to be leaving their city and their destination, the place where they are plan planning to, to travel to, is approximately 75 to 80 kilometers away or, or further. That is what is considered to be the distance of travel. Of course, there are differences of opinion among the ulama. I'm just trying to give uh, the most common opinion and the one, insha'Allah ta'ala, which, uh, which is closest to being correct in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one thing. The second thing is the person is not deemed to be a traveler until they have actually left their city. So for us, as an example, here we are uh, in, in Vancouver. Okay, If you're traveling, let's say, to, to, to Seattle, and you're going by road, and you're going to leave uh, Victoria, and you're going to go to the mainland, you're going to go to Vancouver by ferry. The moment you have boarded the ferry, well, you've left the city behind you. As soon as you get to the ferries, so let's say you boarded the ferry, and the ferry is going to leave and, and, and you know, go over to Vancouver, which is only about 30 kilometers away. But you're, you're actually traveling to Seattle, for example, which is much further than that 30 kilometers. And the time of Vuhar comes in, just for the sake of argument, the time of Vuhar comes in while you're on the ferry. And you want to pray Salat of Vuhar while you're on the ferry. Guess what? You can shorten it and make it only two raka'ah. Because the time only came in once you were actually a traveler, considered to be a traveler. Now, let's bring it to the issue of fasting. So you've left... And, and let, let's say you're, you're, you're flying somewhere. Then when you get to the airport and as soon as you take off, you're considered, to be, you're considered to be a traveler. So now what about fasting? Well, if you happen to leave during the day, when the fasting has already begun, so after Salat al-Fajr, after the time of fasting has commenced, well, if you're, still in, if you're still here in Victoria, then you have to begin the day fasting. You must begin the day fasting. But the moment you are deemed a traveler, when your plane takes off or when the ferry is now on its way to Vancouver, uh, the moment you're considered to be a traveler, you have the option of breaking your fast or keeping your fast. That is your option. Uh, Get some more chairs. That is, that, that is an option that you have. Okay, we're not talking here about what is better and so on and so forth. That we discussed and we'll make we'll summarize it quickly as well. But we're saying that if you wish to break your fast, you may, but only once you are deemed a traveler. Simply having the intention. So I say that you know what? Tomorrow I intend on traveling to Toronto. Okay, my intention is that I'm going to travel. I have a flight at one o'clock in the afternoon. Well, it is not permissible for me to get up tomorrow not fasting. Because am I a traveler yet? I'm not a traveler yet. I'm only one who is intended traveling. But I'm not considered a traveler yet. Only once I'm on that journey and it doesn't mean when I've left my home going to the airport or going to the ferries. No. Either I'm on the ferry or I'm on the plane and it takes off. Only then am I considered to be a traveler. And of course that makes sense. If you really think about it logically, is it not possible that these flights and these uh, sailings are cancelled? Is it not possible that something comes up and, 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 you're, and, and, and you won't make it out of your city? All of those things are possibilities. So un until such... In kuntum ala safar. Ala safar meaning that once you are on the journey. So also looking at the text itself and then looking at things uh, practically speaking, that only once you're, you've commenced that journey and you're considered to be a traveler, you've left your city behind you now, then you may break the fast if you so, if you so wish. So the first type of traveling is the, the traveling which is for a religious purpose and of course it's a permissible travel. Another one could be, Allah forbid, that a person is traveling for something haram. So a guy is traveling to do zina with his girlfriend somewhere. Somebody's traveling to Las Vegas to go gambling or, or wherever it is. But they're traveling for some forbidden, 
forbidden purpose. The majority of the ulama say, in this case, we will not allow that person to not observe the fast. We say, no, it is compulsory upon you to fast because the sharia, well, first of all, that journey of yours in and of itself is haram. You should not be undertaking that journey. You should return. You should stay in your city. You shouldn't travel to do something, something which is impermissible. So does it make sense that the sharia now is going to aid you and to assist you, to support you in this trip? No, to make it easy for you. You know, you, you don't want to get there tired when you go visit your girlfriend. So you know what? Don't fast. You know, by the time you get there, you need to be energetic. You know, a lot of the slot machines that you have to, that, that you have to work on. So no, don't fast. No, the sharia is not going to support that type of haram journey. So the person who is traveling for a haram purpose, an unlawful purpose, it is forbidden for them to not fast. They must fast. This is the opinion of the vast majority of scholars. A person may be traveling just for a vacation. Here is where there is, you know, uh, some difference of opinion. What if I'm traveling just, I'm going on a vacation. Um, I want to go spend a few days and, 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 and shop in XYZ city. You know, so in this case, is it, we're not talking about whether it's better or not. Let, let's not go there. We're talking about the permissibility. Am I permitted to not fast while I'm a traveler? The correct or the most correct opinion is that yes, it is permissible. Because the journey that you're going on is not haram. It's not haram for you to go shopping. It's not haram for you to go vacationing somewhere. I mean, it's not haram. That's, that's the bottom line. And therefore, it's difficult for us to say, no, you cannot make use of those concessions granted by the Sharia. We can't really say that. We rather, we would rather we say, okay, whether it's better or not, that's another issue. But is it permissible if you wanted to not observe the fast? Yes, it is permissible for you to not observe the fast while you are considered to be a traveler. Okay? Uh, however, which is better? Well. If you are on a journey, of course now we're speaking about a legitimate journey, either that you're going for a religious purpose or even if it's for a worldly purpose that is not forbidden, okay, like the last example that I mentioned, then in this case, we don't make a blanket statement and say it's better for you uh, not to fast or it is better for you to fast. It will depend on the circumstances and we find in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he, while on a journey, fasted. And then he broke the fast, what, about eight days into the journey. On that day when they came to a spot and it was just very difficult and people were experiencing uh, a lot of hardship. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that too at the time of Asr, he broke his fast and others followed and some didn't. Okay, we have an, 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 and we have the Sahaba telling us that we used to travel with the Prophet Sallallahu Some of us would be fasting, others would not be fasting, and neither group blamed the other. So this group didn't say to the one group, what kind of people are you not fasting? Look, we're fasting. Come on, be men. Man up. And the other group didn't say, look, we're better than you. We're not fasting. You know why? Because Allah gave us that permission. So we're making use of that concession. Neither group blamed the other. It was allowed for them to either fast or not fast. However, one day on a journey, the Sahaba were gathered around a man who had basically collapsed. A man who had basically collapsed. And of course, in that case, the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not from righteousness for the traveler to fast. How come? Because of the circumstance. I mean, if it's going to lead to you fainting and experiencing such, such hardship, then it is, not, it is not the best thing for you to fast. So depending on the circumstances, we say that it may be better for you to fast, it may be better for you not to fast. Either way, either way, if a person fasts while they're on a journey, then it is a valid fast and it is an accepted fast. Having said that, there are some, although they are a small minority, who say that if you are ill or if you are traveling, it is compulsory for you not to fast. Okay, um, you know they're taking the, the ayah at face value, but then you, you, if you look to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then you see that it is 
it is further explained and so we, we, we understand that it depends on the circumstances whether it is better for you to fast or better for you not to fast the next category we also mention them Al-Ha'idhu wa nufasa tufqirani wa taqdiyani wa in samata lam yujzi'huma and before that for the first category who are the ill who could be adversely affected by fasting and the traveler we said that if they fasted it would be accepted from them if they didn't fast this is their right it is permissible and the only thing they need to do he says here فالفطر أو, uh, لهما أفضل. he said I mean his opinion is that breaking the fast or not fasting is better for them but we explain how come because it brings hardship and so on and so forth this is what he's speaking of وعليهم القضاء so if a person didn't fast while traveling or due to illness, then they need to make up the days that they did not fast during Ramadan. That is it. They don't need to pay any expiation. There is no type of penalty. This is what he means by وَعَلَيْهِمَا الْقَضَاءِ You just need to make it up. فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So before the next Ramadan comes around, the person should make up the days that they missed in, in the Ramadan of the previous of the previous year okay so for example now we're in the year 14 1438 so in the year 1437 if a person missed any fasts then they should make them up before ramadan comes up in you know it's around the corner it's barely barely a month uh, a month away okay the next category al haidhu wa nufasa tufqirani wa taqdiyani wa in samata lam yudzihuma so here he says that a woman who is menstruating or who is uh, experiencing postpartum bleeding, these women must not fast. They cannot observe the fast. Tuftirani, they have to break the fast. Wataqdiyani, and they have to make it up. The same as what we mentioned earlier. Before the next Ramadan comes, they need to make it. They need to make up the fasts that they missed. وَإِن صَامَتَ لَمْ يُدْزِئِهُمَا And let's say they decided they want to fast while they are menstruating or experiencing postnatal bleeding. He says it would not count. That fast would not be valid. And there are among the ulama who said, as a matter of fact, it is a sin for her to do so. Because the command of the Prophet ﷺ was that they not fast during the month of Ramadan. So it would not count and would even be considered a sin. The third category, and that's where we uh, we left off the last time. Al-Hamilu wal-Murdi'u idha khafata. Now this can be a little bit complicated, but as we've been doing all along, we're going to try to simplify it bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Al-Hamilu wal-Murdi'u idha khafata ala anfusihima afparata wa qadata. وَإِنْ خَافَتَ عَلَىٰ وَلَدَيْهِمَا أَفْطَرَتَ وَقَضَتَ وَأَطْعَمَتَ عَنْ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينًا So here he's talking about the pregnant woman and the woman who is breastfeeding. Let's begin by making one thing clear. Pregnancy in and of itself, breastfeeding in and of itself is not a valid excuse not to fast. This we need to get out of our heads. There are many who take the matter so lightly, oh, you know what, I'm pregnant, so I'm not going to fast. I'm breastfeeding, so I'm not, going to, I'm not going to fast. It's not as simple as that. Remember what we mentioned about an illness also? Well, the same things apply here. And, and this is why he gives a little bit of detail. He says, Al-hamilu wal الحامل والمرضع إذا خافتا على أنفسهما. If either the pregnant woman or the breastfeeding woman feared for themselves, fasting would be harmful to them. Not just because you know I I think it would be very difficult. Well, this is not this is not what we're talking about. They know um, either from previous experience or that uh, a trustworthy doctor tells them that you know what, fasting 
is not going to be good for you. You're not going to manage. It is, it is detrimental to your health. We're not even talking about now. We're not talking about the fetus. We're not talking about the baby. We're talking about the woman herself. If fasting is going to be harmful to her and she has a genuine fear, then and only then is she allowed not to observe the fast. But it is not that, oh, pregnant, breastfeeding, don't worry about it, you don't have to fast. No, you do have to fast. But if you fear harm, and it's a genuine fear, if it's a genuine fear, then by all means, you may not observe the fast. That is your choice. Okay? Mind you, if it was a definite harm, and, you know, uh, you, the, the woman started fasting, but then she, she, she experiences extreme, extreme hardship in the day. And it could lead to something serious. In that case, it's, it's wajib for her to break the fast. But if she's experiencing some hardship, but she can make it, it's not like it's going to be the end of the world or anything, uh, then if she chooses to continue, she may. And if she chooses to break the fast, she may also, because of the extreme, because of the extreme hardship that it is, that it is causing her. Okay, so for either one of them, he makes it very distinct. The first thing he says is, if they fear for themselves, excluding, excluding the child or the fetus. There's no worries. The fetus will manage. If you fast, nothing's going to happen to the fetus. It's just that we're worried about your health. Okay, so some women are very adversely affected. Others are not. Every woman is different. Okay? In this case, he says that they break the fast and... All they need to do is, before the next Ramadan rolls around, they need to make up the fasts that they missed. Okay. Then he says, وَإِنْ خَافَتَ عَلَى وَلَدَيْهِمَا But if they fear for the fetus, for the child that they are carrying, as far as fasting is concerned, it wouldn't affect them in any way. So now the woman wouldn't be affected. But the fetus might be affected. If there's a genuine reason to fear that, and once again, you know, because of uh, the testimony of a trustworthy doctor, for example, if there's a genuine fear for the fetus, then in this case she may also not observe the fast. Because there's a genuine fear. But in that case, according to, uh, according to the majority of the ulama, وَإِنْ خَافَتَ عَلَى وَلَدَيْهِمَا أَفْطَرَتَا They don't observe the fast. وَقَضَتَا they have to make up for the fast that they missed, plus they have to do something else in addition. وَأَطْعَمَتَا عَنْ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينًا And for every day that they missed, they also have to feed a poor person. Okay, because this fear was not of her own health. So they're saying that there's a distinction. If it affects you, the woman, personally, then you break the fast and you have only to make it up and there is no there is no feeding of a poor of a poor person along with that but if it's not going to affect you and what it is is something other than you meaning the child the fetus then okay don't fast you have to make up for the fast but you also have to feed a poor person how much or what is the amount of food that i need to give and now this is the opinion of, of the vast majority and it's safer for us to take this opinion. Although, you know, the other argument is kind of strong too. But nonetheless, uh, a third scenario is it's harmful to the woman and the child. Well, it takes a ruling of the first one. It's still harmful on the woman, so that's, uh, that, that's a no-brainer. But let, let, now, let's say that we take this opinion and it's the safer opinion to take. She doesn't fast, okay, that's, that's her prerogative. She's allowed to do that. Um, and she has to make it up. Everybody agrees on that. It's that feeding part that, you know, there's some debate on. But we say to be on the safe side, feed. So what amount would be sufficient to be considered as having fed a poor person? Well, if we look to the Sharia, there are many things that are mentioned. And what is mentioned with regards to this type of thing is Rub'u Sa'a. Now, a Sa'a is a, uh, a dry measure. Okay, so we give one sa' of dates or rice or uh, grains in, in zakat al-fitr, for example. Right? A sa' is four handfuls. 
And we're talking about, you know, medium-sized handfuls, like, because of course the Prophet ﷺ was speaking about the size of his hands. Okay, he wasn't a small man, he wasn't a huge man, he was somewhere in between. Now, you know, if you try to gauge it in, 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 in kilograms, then we're looking at approximately, in, you know, between three to four kilograms of rice, for example. Which means, so if it's four handfuls, it's one handful. So uh, if we're looking at rice, for example, that would be approximately 750 grams of rice. Some of them say a quarter of a sa'ah, others say half a sa'ah. In other words, it would be what, about one and a half kilograms of rice. Okay? So that quantity of food for each day missed, you would have to give it to a separate poor person. Okay? So you, find, you, you could give, for example, though, let's say you find a home, uh, with, you know, a, a, poor, a poor family, husband, wife, and two kids. And by the way, it can't work any other way. It can't be husband, husband, wife, wife. It, it, you know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, husband, man and woman makes a couple, okay? Anyway, so a husband and a wife and two children, say. So you could give them one saw, like three kilograms, and that is taking care of four days. That would have taken care of four days because you fed four, four people. Now, we're going to talk about the feeding of poor people. Do you know there's another way to do it as well? And, and a person has that choice. You could also say, you know what, I'm going to have prepared food. Okay? Enough to satisfy that person. So feeding each person, meaning giving them one satisfactory meal. Whether it be a lunch, breakfast, or, or dinner. Okay? So you could maybe... Uh, so you had 10 days. So you need to feed 10 people. Alright? So you could prepare enough food for 10 people and invite 10 poor and, uh, or needy people and if they ate from that food and, and it's a satisfying uh, meal Alhamdulillah that, that obligation has been, has been waived Okay, so the, the, they say here uh, well he says وَإِنْ خَافَتَ عَلَى وَلَدَيْهِمَا So if the fear is on the child not on the woman herself she breaks the fast she makes it up and she feeds a poor person for each day after that So this is the third category الرابر. العاجز عن الصيام لكبر أو مرض لا يرجى برؤه فإنه يطعم عنه عن كل يطعم عنه عن كل يوم مسكينا. Okay, so now the fourth category of people, you know, who it is permissible for them not to fast. He says a person who has reached old age. You know, they they became or they've reached an age at which point they're very fragile. Physically, they cannot tolerate the fast. At that age, it's just not possible for them to fast any longer. Or a person who is terminally ill, okay? So it's an illness due to which they cannot fast, and there is no real hope that they will be cured. May Allah protect us all, but there are people who may be terminally ill, and there's really no hope for them. You know, certain uh, cancer patients, uh, people with, with kidney disease, and there's no hope for them that, you know, it's unlikely, it's unlikely likely that they're going to overcome this illness and that they're going to get through it. Okay? But fasting adversely affects them. And they're never going to be able to fast. So what about these people? What, what, what do we do with them? I mean, that person's not going to find some magic treatment that's going to make them younger now so they can be strong enough to fast, right? So for these people who are uh, so old and, and fragile that they cannot fast and their illness is, is a terminal one, it's very unlikely or highly unlikely that, it's, uh, that they're going to be cured. He says, فَإِنَّهُ يُطْعَمُ عَنْهُ عَنْ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينًا So obviously that person doesn't fast because they're physically incapable of fasting. And... There is no way for us to say, well, you know what, fast later on. Well, they're not going to get younger and it's not likely that, that they're going to get better. So for them, for each day that they miss, they have to feed a poor person. But don't come at the beginning of Ramadan and say, you know, well, this person, for example, is a very old mom or dad or this uh, person that we know who is terminally ill. So let's, let's feed 30 poor people at the beginning of the month. No, it has to be 
either at the end of each day or you can delay it until the end of the month and whether it was 29 days or 30 days and then uh, feed, a poor, feed 30 poor people or 29 poor people at the end, at the end of the month. Or you could do it you know, day by day. You have that choice. We already talked about how much you have to give. So if you're going to be giving it in, in, in raw ingredients, then we mentioned if it's going to be, say, rice or dates or some type of a grain, then it's... Uh, the more we give, the better. The more we give... فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ The more that you, that you voluntarily give, the better it is for you, as Allah Jalla wa ala, uh, tells us in the Qur'an. But the requirement is either the quarter of a saw, which is a mud, uh, the handful, we said approximately 750 grams, but to be on the safe side, go more for the half, which is one and a half uh, kilograms, or even more if you wish to give, because then you will attain, you will attain a reward, a reward for that. Okay? He says, so I, I think that's quite clear, the, the elderly who cannot fast, and those who are terminally ill, and there's no hope that that they're going to be that they're going to be cured. So generally speaking, generally speaking, a person who does not observe the fast for a legitimate reason simply has to make that day up. With some of the exceptions that we mentioned, and we're going to mention uh, others right now. Illa man aftara bijima'in fil farji fa innahu yaqdi wa yu'tiqu raqabah. فَإِن لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ فَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَإِطْعَامُ سِتِينَ مِسْكِينًا فَإِن لَمْ يَجِدْ سَقَطَتْ عَنْهُ So now he's talking about people who, uh, who don't observe the fast, okay, then, or they break the fast for no, even for no legitimate reason. All that is required of them, along with Tawbah, of course, especially if it's for no legitimate reason, uh, along with Tawbah, or repentance, then they have to make up that day. Okay? And the reason that we want to mention this is because there are some, uh, there are some misconceptions among the people. A person out of laziness doesn't fast. Laziness is not a valid excuse. A person has exams, so they don't fast. It's not a valid excuse. It's a sin for them not to fast. It's haram for them not to fast for an exam. Or they have a, you know, a, a soccer game. Come on. Or a hockey game, or whatever. Not a valid reason not to fast. The rights of Allah come before everything else. Okay? But let's say, for the sake of argument, they didn't fast. You know, because... Uh, tomorrow in PE, we're going to have this, you know, uh, this, this soccer match and it's, uh, you know, my class against another class and, you know, we got to win. And I'm, I'm the head person in that, uh, on that team. Without me, they're not going to win. Right? So, the, so, so, so you decide not to fast. Haram. It's a major sin. So what is required of that person? who doesn't observe the fast, and it's not really a legitimate reason, they have to do tawbah. This is the first thing. They must do tawbah. They have to repent. Because what they've done is they've committed a major sin. And they have to make up that day. Just one day. Unlike what some people say, 60 days. Well, why? There is no evidence to show that a person who breaks the fast for some, you know, not legitimate reason, has to fast for 60 days. That 60 day thing comes in, but it's for something in particular. We have the sunnah which explains that 60 days. But it is not just for a person who broke the fast. Yes, it's a major sin. We are not taking away from that. It is a major sin. And they must repent sincerely. Otherwise, Allah will hold them accountable for that. And they have to make up one day. A day for a day. Not 60 days. All right. All right. This is why he mentions here that وَعَلَى سَائِرِ مَنْ أَفْطَرَ الْقَضَاءَ لَا غَيْرِ Nothing else. And we can't even say, okay, you have to make up the fast and you have to feed uh, a poor person as well for that one day. No, but if part of your tawbah is that you, of course, you, 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 you repent to Allah, but you want to follow it up with a good deed by giving sadaqah, by whatever, that's okay. But that's your choice. It is not an obligation. 
It is not an obligation. Understand that. Then he continues, I, I, you know, and he says, "Illa man aftara bijima." So the exception is if a man or a woman have intercourse in the daytime of Ramadan when they're supposed to be fasting. In this case, in this case, no. It's not just making up the day. They've committed a major sin. And we know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where a man comes and in one of the narrations that he's even, you know, practically beating himself that I, I, I brought destruction upon myself and I've destruct, caused destruction for my wife. Hey, what happened? What happened? Oh, you know what? During the daytime of Ramadan, while I was fasting, I had intimate relations. In other words, here we're talking specifically about intercourse. I had intercourse with my wife. So here is where the Prophet ﷺ told him or asked him, are you capable of freeing a slave? In other words, do you either own a slave whom you can free or do you have the funds to purchase a slave and then free that slave? This is, this is the penalty. So what they have to do is, such people they have to do tawbah, yes, they have to repent. They'll have to make up that day. Plus, on top of that, they have to free a, they have to free a slave. And it has to be a Muslim slave. Whether male or female, but it has to be a slave. All right? Now, the man said he's not capable. And in this day and age, the vast majority of us, pretty much everybody, will not be able to do it. Why? Because you'd be hard-pressed to find an actual genuine slave, according to the definition of the Sharia. Okay? Not call, call up Mali Maid and say, hey, I want to pay, <laughs> pay one of them a year's salary and free her of, of her duties. Okay, now we're talking about a, a real slave according to the Sharia. So, more than likely we wouldn't be able to. In our, in our day. In, in, in those days they were able to. But he didn't have the means. He did not have the means. Neither did he own a slave, nor could he afford to buy a slave. And we said it has to be a believing slave. Now, there may be some dispute, but the, the correct opinion, Wallahu A'lam, is that it has to be a Muslim slave. And, you know, all of us knows that incident uh, of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Maybe we didn't know the full context. Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks this female slave hmm, um, about, her, about her faith. Okay? So she said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. She also said, Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So she testified that she is a, she is a Muslim woman. He, she asked, where is Allah? And she said, in the heavens. And the Prophet ﷺ then said to her master, أَعْتِقْهَا فَإِنَّهَا مُؤْمِنَا Free her, for indeed she is, she is a believer. Well, the context of it is that he had done something for which a, a slave needed to be freed. So first the Prophet ﷺ ascertained whether or not that slave was a believer, was, was a Muslim. She was? Okay, then free her. That would, that would count for you. Okay, so... He said, I can't. I, I don't have the means. So then the Prophet wasallam said, fast for uh, two consecutive months. Fast for two consecutive months. You notice in what context it is? For this particular sin and crime that he committed. That he had intercourse with his wife in the daytime of Ramadan. When he was fasting. Alright? So here then, the Prophet ﷺ went to the next. He said, hang on a second. This is what got me into this mess to begin with. In other words, in other words, you know what? I'm that kind of person. I can't keep my hands off her. And, and, and in his case, fasting just was not possible. So it's not for somebody to say, well, I think fasting 60 consecutive days would be pretty tough. So what, what's, the next, uh, what's the next option? It's not like that. No, you have to do it. But in this case, the Prophet ﷺ knew that the person was incapable of fasting 60 consecutive days. Is it going to be difficult? You better well believe it. Of course it's going to be difficult to fast 60 consecutive days. We do it in Ramadan, 29 or 30 days. That's pretty tough. 
But 60 consecutive days, in other words, you can't take a break in between. One day after another. So, the man said he, he can't, and the Prophet ﷺ realized that this man is physically incapable of doing so. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, Feed 60 poor people. But he said, yeah, I ain't got that kind of money. He was poor himself. He was poor himself. So he's incapable of, of even feeding 60 poor people. Just to complete that hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ had a basket of dates brought before him. Okay? And it contained 15 sa. And that's where we got the quarter sa from. Because 15 and for 60 days. So, he's, so he said, you know what? It's with this that you can feed that you can feed the people. He says, well, I'm, I'm in more need of it than anybody else. So the Prophet ﷺ laughed. He smiled. You know, this man came and look at the condition that he was in. Like he was, he was fretting because he's basically brought destruction upon himself. He, he committed this major sin and is going back, you know, full-handed. He's going back with something for his house. He didn't even have food. He was a poor man. Okay. So here, what's important to us is this. If a person breaks the fast in Ramadan, okay, not in a qada fast, not one that he's making up for that he missed in Ramadan. We're talking about during the month of Ramadan, husband and wife are fasting, but they have intercourse during the daytime. The nighttime is not a problem because after Maghrib, until the break of true dawn, it's a free-for-all, right? But other than that, no, you, you are supposed to be fasting, but they... They break their fast in this way. Well, it's a major sin. And Tawbah is required. Uh, making up for it is required. And either freeing a slave. And if that, is, if that is not possible, then fasting 60 consecutive days. And if that is not possible, then, then feeding 60 poor people. Let's come to the issue, because we already discussed the, uh, the part of the slave. And we already discussed how much a person needs to feed. But what about those 60 consecutive days? What if a person is going to do that, but then, and, and particularly for a woman, for example, all of a sudden, she's fasting, but let's face it, uh, younger women, or women who are still menstruating, well, they're not going to be able to go 60 consecutive days, are they? Because in between, they're going to menstruate. Does that have any effect on breaking the continuity? The answer is no, it doesn't affect it. Why? Because it, it is not in her hands. She's not able to control it. Oh, okay, then I'll take these pills. That, no, no, th why bring that hardship on yourself? The Sharia didn't require that of you. Fast, 15, 18, 20 days, and then you menstruate. All right, you're for forgiven. For that break in continuity, you are forgiven. But as soon as now you're able to again, the, you, you, your menstruation period is over, then you pick it up and you continue until you finish your 60 days. What if you're fasting, everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden you get very sick. Allah forbid, but you get very sick, man or woman. You get really ill and, and you can't fast because of your illness. That also does not affect the continuity. Okay, you break the fast for the days uh, that, that you absolutely need to, and then you can pick up afterwards and finish and finish your 60 days. Um, it could be that you started fasting, and it so happens that now, well, you got to fast 60 days, but when you started, the day of Eid came, Eid al-Adha in between in those 60 days. Now it's not permissible for you to fast on the day of Eid. Here there's a difference of opinion among the ulama. There are those who say, well, you're not allowed to fast on the day of Eid, but if you are being penalized in this way, then you have to fast. And the other said, no, the continuity is not affected because the Sharia made that exception. That day you're not supposed to fast. Okay, so we say, Wallahu a'lam, if the person didn't fast on the day of Eid, they would be excused. And it would not affect the continuity. The bottom line is, they must fast two consecutive months. 
I say 60 days. The correct, the correct expression is two consecutive months. If you start at the beginning of a month, okay, let's say the person started at the beginning of the month of Al-Muharram. Okay, so they fast two months, two consecutive months. Al-Muharram and Safar, those two months. Is it possible that that's only going to be 59 days? Yeah, it could be that one month is 29 days and one, one month is 30 days. And this is why, by the way, from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is that, and as a matter of fact, it's a fardu uh, kifaya, it's a communal obligation that in the ummah we must have people always looking for the crescent moon to know when the month begins because many things are dependent on it. Many uh, sharia rulings are dependent on those months. This is one of them. Okay, two consecutive months. Don't just assume that there are 60 days. No, it could be 29 days. I mean, maybe it's rare, but both months could have been 29 days. Or one could have been 29, one could have been 30. Okay? But if a person starts somewhere in between, you started on the 2nd of the month, you started on the 12th of the month, on the 20th of the month, ah, in this case we say 60 days. Because now you don't have the, the, the luxury of counting two consecutive months. So we go back to the basic principle, which is that a month is the basic principle, which is that the month is uh, the month is sixty. The month is, is thirty days. Okay, and when it's twenty nine days, that is that is an exception. All right. So here he says, uh, or he clarifies what the punishment is, and again, just to make things uh, just to make things clear, if it's for another reason. It could be something haram that a person did. Let's say that the person was just messing around and playing with their wife. Or, and, and, and by the way, in, in that hadith, the man had relations with his wife. So a person says, so if, they, if, if he did zina, if he, if he had intercourse with a woman that he's not supposed to have intercourse with, then he only has to make up a day. He doesn't have to pay the penalty. We say, come on, give it a rest. <laughs> if he had to pay the penalty... For doing so with a woman that is halal for him, what, the penalty is all of a sudden waived because he did it with somebody who is haram for him? That doesn't even make sense. Alright, so no, it counts even if it was somebody that is haram for him. What if, Allah forbid, what if that person is gay and he practiced sodomy? He had intercourse with Riyadh Billah in the back passage with, with his male, with his male uh, partner in crime. Then what? Then obviously the same thing, the same thing applies. All of those things are haram. Okay, all of that is haram. So the same penalty would apply, uh, would apply to that individual. But if the person was messing around, you know, playing around and foreplay and so on and so forth, and they ejaculated, all right, then in this case, that penalty of the sixty. Uh, of 60 poor people are freeing a slave or fasting the uh, two consecutive months, that penalty doesn't apply because they fell short of actually having, of actually having intercourse. And the same ruling applies to a person, Allah forbid that they, they masturbated in the daytime of Ramadan and they ejaculated. So this goes for both men and women. If they did that, which is haram for them to do, and it's even worse if it's done in the month of Ramadan and during the daytime of Ramadan, then in this case, the fast has been broken, they have to do toba. they have to make up that day, but there is no uh, other penalty along with that in terms of freeing a slave or fasting two consecutive months or feeding, or feeding 60 poor people. And the last thing on that particular issue is, um, and, and the reason is, and especially for people who don't understand, you know, uh, and, and today, mashallah, we're quick to give fatwa whether we, whether we have knowledge or we don't have knowledge, right? So maybe your friend comes to you and says, you know, I was kind of uh, messing around with my wife and our private parts touched. There was no penetration, but, you know, we were naked and our parts touched. Oh, you got, oh no, hang on a second. The rule only applies if there is actual penetration. And again, this is one of those things in the Sharia ah that, that we have to understand. We can't speak without knowledge. Don't tell people they have to do X, Y, or Z without knowing whether or not they really have to do it or not. Okay, all right. So then, we're done with this particular with this particular part. Okay, so we did that. فَإِن جَامَعَ وَلَمْ يُكَفِّرْ حَتَّى جَامِعَ ثَانِيَةً فَكَفَارَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ فَإِن كَفَّرَ ثُمَّ جَامَعَ فَكَفَارَةٌ ثَانِيَةٌ Okay. Now he's talking about what if a person, 
what if a person had intercourse with, with their wife on that day and they paid the expiation? In other words, that person either fed, fed 60 poor people or was able to free or is able to free a slave. Okay? So the, they took care of the expiation. Now, of course, remember this. If a person breaks the fast in a non-legitimate way in Ramadan, whether it be through masturbation or it be through having intercourse or some reason that is not acceptable in the Sharia, it doesn't mean, well, since I broke my fast, I can just eat and drink the rest of the day. No. There's still hurma to shahr, the sanctity of the month that you have to observe and you have to respect. Even in that case, we say, it doesn't mean now you can just go and eat and drink. Well, you know, my fast is gone, my fast is gone. No, you have to respect the sanctity of the month. And so you have to abstain from eating and drinking. So he's saying, what if they paid the penalty and then they did it again? person says, well, you know, he, according to, 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 to Imam Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah ta'ala, and the Hanbali Madhab, then he'd have to pay another expiation for doing it on the same day. But the majority say no. That one expiation covers it, but he has sinned and he has to do tawbah for the second time that he had relations with his wife during that day. Okay? So, do, so this is another important thing also to remember that if a person breaks the fast by doing something impermissible, it doesn't mean the rest of the day, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it, do whatever you want. No, the day has to be respected as a day from the days of Ramadan. The sanctity, the hurma of that day must be, must be respected. Uh, but what is required is for each day, if that were to happen more than once in the month, for each day a new expiation would have to be paid. But it's not; it wouldn't be like two for one day because you happen to do uh, that, uh, commit that sin twice on on the same day. This is what he was talking about here. Okay. وَكُلُّ مَنْ لَزِمَهُ الْإِمْسَاكِ فِي رَمَضَانٍ فَجَامَعَ فَعَلَيْهِ كَفَارًا. Okay, so we have mentioned that. وَمَنْ أَخَرَ الْقَضَاءَ لِعُذْرٍ حَتَّى أَدْرَكَهُ رَمَضَانَ آخَرْ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ غَيْرُ الْقَضَاءِ So here we're talking about, you know, I think our time is up. So maybe, maybe we'll stop here and, and I'll make a note and we can, continue, uh, we, we can continue from here the next time. So he's talking about, remember how I mentioned that uh, if, if you break your fast for a legitimate reason, or for that matter, even if it's not a legitimate reason, uh, and you have, to, uh, you have to make up that fast, you have to do a qadha. It should be done before the next Ramadan comes. Before the next Ramadan comes. This is what, you know, this is what is expected. So now he's going to talk about what if somebody delays so much, the next Ramadan comes, and they haven't made up yet. What do they have to do in that case? That's what uh, we'll, we'll continue with the next time, inshallah ta'ala. Hada wallahu a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Okay, it is time for Maghrib. So uh, uh, maybe what we can do is, let, let's take five or ten minutes, and then we pray Maghrib, and then we can, we can go. All right? So if there are any questions or comments, we can, uh, we can deal with them at this time, bi idhnillah. About the fasting, I, I, I've been reading a lot about the, the history of, of Islam and all that. Um, one of the things that I read is that it's permissible not to fast if, say, you are in like a conflict or or battle. Uh, is that true? Yeah, I mean, as far as reasons why a person may may not fast. I mean, if the Muslims were under siege, okay, and they are in a battle and they're defending themselves, or they've gone somewhere and they are fighting somewhere, well, if they've gone somewhere and they're fighting somewhere, then by virtue of them traveling, they're allowed not to fast, okay? But let's say that you're, you know, the, the Muslims are in their homeland and they are defending themselves against an enemy. Well, you will find that they will fast. They will fast, but if the need arises because they need their strength and their energy and so they need to break their fast for that reason then that is a, a legitimate reason Wallahu ta'ala a'lam okay? A woman breaks her fast because she's uh, because she cares for her life when she's pregnant or breastfeeding Is it like is it preferable that she pays uh, for those for the feeding of those 
64 people if that was on her? Uh, or is it the one person? I don't recall what you mentioned. No. So if a woman breaks the... If a woman breaks the fast because she fears for herself, yeah. because she fears for herself, then we said she only needs to make up those days. Just those days. Okay. She only there's no feeding required at all because okay. she feared for herself. Okay. She only needs to make up those days. Okay. There is another opinion that says she doesn't need to make them up. She just needs to. to she she can just uh, feed a poor person for each day. But that's that's very debatable. And it really, really does not, it's not the, it's a minority opinion. Uh, and that's not what makes it weak. It's the evidences that they base it on, which are, which are rather uh, flimsy. So if she, if she fears for her child, then she, uh, has, she has to make it up. she has to make it up and, 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 and to be on the safe side, feed a poor person for each day also. So in that case, is it better that she pays from her own money? Or is it okay if her husband comes to her? It's up to them. If the husband chooses, then he can say to her, I'll pay on your behalf. And if she says, no, I'll, I want to pay for myself, then she can pay. The, the obligation is on her. The obligation is on her. But it is her, his child too. Right? So there has to be, I mean, depending on circumstances, I mean, the husband can say, you know, I, I, I will pay on your behalf. So a person, for example, can find a town in Somalia where they have like 100 people that are very poor and can offer to pay them at the end of the term, yes. at the end of the month, pay yes. them for a whole day. Yes. All right. As long as that number, of, so there were five days, for example, thirty days, then you feed that many people. Or give one person provisions for that number of days. Yeah, that's debatable. Sitina miskinan, sixty different or or miskinan, itamu miskin, a different poor person. And then some said, on each day you could give, you can't give that one person thirty days worth. Oh, okay. But, but, but where some of them made a distinction is they said, some said, no, it has to be 30 different people. And others said it could be the same person, but you have to give them on separate days, not all at once. But be on the safe side and make sure it's different people. Just a clarification. So if you travel during Ramadan, you don't have to break your fast if you're... If you're yes. Annoyed. If you travel during Ramadan, you are not obliged to break the fast. You have the choice of either keeping the fast or breaking it. Hmm? Yes. All right, so that's what actually what we're going to be starting to discuss the next time. And, and, and basically for her then, she does it as she's capable, as she's able. Okay, and there's no penalty on her whatsoever. Okay. Anything else? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi.